Hello, 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 and welcome again to Bible study. And of course, I am your pastor. You know, I say that with such pride. I, I really do. And I, I, I like to think that it's a healthy and godly pride. But I am very much so proud to be your pastor. Those of you that are members of New Home Family Worship Center, I promise you it's the joy of my life to be your pastor. Um, and I miss you so much. Those of you that are connecting with us um, digitally through the cyber church platform, uh, I am so proud to be considered or esteemed so highly even in your lives. Um, today I want to start uh, a teaching. I don't know how long this is going to go, but it's something that we, we taught um, a lot of years ago. And, and I taught it because it was very um, important to me relative to the body of believers that I uh, was shepherding at the time. Understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, the mind and spirituality. Understanding the mind and spirituality. I just got through doing a, um, an interview with a medical doctor who um, she and I have a lot in common. She coming from the medical and the physical, I'm coming from the, the religious and the spiritual. We both find a common ground in terms of the importance of the mind. Because she's a scientist, she does not say, well, the mind is irrelevant, just, you know, the science of medicine is, is the most important. Or just because I'm um, clergy, I don't say, okay, the mind is irrelevant, just the spiritual. It is the, it is the synergy of the spirit, the mind, and the body. Now, that's not hard to put together in a person's mind, but how few people actually put that concept together, that there must be a balance between the spirit, the soul or the mind and the body. Connecting, here's the, the specific lesson title for this lesson, Connecting Thinking and Spirituality. I don't think I'm going to get through this whole lesson today, so this will probably be in two parts. Connecting thinking and spirituality. Today the church has been um, really dumbed down. It's, it seems to be quite honest with you. Um, I have a friend of mine, I just bought his book, Dr. Dana Carson, who is a scholar and a real theologian. He has DR in front of his name for a very real reason. He, he wrote a textbook, and I'm looking at it, uh, A Journey Through Church History. Um, the church has been dumbed down, and I was saying it seems as though every century after the inception of the church with the original apostles, you know, and, and and, and, and Paul and so forth and so on, it seems as though the church has consistently been dumbed down. And by that I mean, originally when the, when the church first started, you know, when Jesus ascended and the apostles started teaching, people were crowding into spaces to be taught. And the apostles had to, you know, confer with one another relative to what was being taught and things were being judged and critiqued and debated. And the spiritual entity of the church was committed to thinking. It was committed to teaching. But then as the, as the church grew, you know, miraculously, and uh, the people meeting in houses was no, long, was no longer viable, 
<clears throat> now you, you start getting to a place where they have to actually have meeting places and now the, the preachers or the leaders of the church are, um, you know, politically influential because the people, the preachers had the ears of the people. So now the politicians started funneling resources to the preachers to get the preachers to, you know, get the people so that the politicians could manage the, the community through, through, the, through the pulpit. And so then, you know, the church just got more. It seems as though the more the church got organized, the dumber the church got. Then you get to, to a point where the church, and I'm not going to get into, you know, anything relative to all of the various denominations or what have you. But you get to a point where uh, they started writing the scriptures in languages the people couldn't understand. They started using, using the preachers started using uh, theological, religious rhetoric that, that was above people's heads and people would come and sit in so-called worship experiences to hear a preacher preach in a language that they couldn't even understand and had Bibles that they couldn't even read. It's because the more we, the further, it seems as though the further we, we, we've gotten away from the original inception of the church, the more flesh took over leadership. And the more the flesh took over the leadership, the dumber the leadership of the church uh, wanted the people to be. So as to manipulate the masses for what? Power and money. And so now you have um, people like Martin Luther who says, well, this ain't going to work. Not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, you know, put his uh, thesis on, on, on the church door. He said, this ain't going to work. We, we need to understand. We need teaching. That's basically what he was saying. Y'all ripping us off. And so now you start having the what? Reformation of the church, the reformation of the church where now the church is trying to make a move back to what it was intended for, to be the spiritual and even the intellectual hub of the Christian community. We were taught everything in the church from relationships to money to sex. We were taught that within the constructs of the church. But now you know, the church still has a long ways to go. And then you come to an era and a time where the church became more emotional than it even really was spiritual. And no, no intellectual value whatsoever, just a lot of emotion. And today, many churches have made a living on just the emotionalism of religion. But now we're in a generation that says, Y'all's religious traditions and your emotions are not going to work for us. It does not mean that we don't love God. We just don't like y'all's brand of religion of religion. That dumb, you know, ignorant religion that is driven by emotion or just the rhetoric of people that uh, supposed to be in high places does not work for us. And so now we're at a point where if. If ministry is to be relevant, the ministers are going to have to reconnect thinking to spirituality. The church should not be a place where people are encouraged to check their thinking caps at the door. If you go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Two says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The two key words of this text are conformed and transformed. I love teaching this text. Conformed, the Greek word there is. Suskamatizo. It means to fashion alike, to conform to the same pattern. 
be not conformed, made into the same pattern, but be transformed. Don't be made into the same pattern of this world, but be transformed. Metamorpho, to change, transfigure, transform. Conformed to fashion alike, conform to the same pattern. It's the majority experience of group thinking, conformity. You go along with the group and all of you have the same group experience. We don't have enough. Um, um, we don't have enough unusual preachers anymore. When I was a kid coming up, we had a lot of unusual preachers. My father was an unusual preacher preacher you know wasn't nobody like him he had his own blazing his own path doing his own thing well doing God's thing through him you see Bishop Martin he was strange had his own path doing his own thing nobody was doing it like him um, GE Bishop GE Patterson at that time apostle I knew him as apostle GE Patterson nobody like him what, what made these men uh, Dr. E. V. Hill, nobody like him, had the privilege of, the terrifying privilege of preaching for him one day with him sitting there. Terrifying. But what made these men so different? It's because none of them were group thinkers. They were all connected spiritually to God <clears throat> and they had their own minds under the auspices of God. Now, so none of them were none, none of them were conformist, transform. It's the idea of becoming something unique and different according to God's plan for you as an individual. The text commands us to avoid conforming or being becoming like the world around us and to strive for transformation. It also goes further to explain how we get to transformation and we get to transformation by the renewing of our minds. The renewing, he uses the term renewing and it's the Greek word anachronosis, meaning to renovate or to update. God Almighty, that's good. Re renovate or update your mind to experience transformation. So we can conclude the way one conforms is by not renovating or updating your thinking. Just go along with, with the group, just, just be a dummy and, and just blend in. But if you're gonna transform and become something absolutely amazing, he says you're going to have to go through anachronosis, the renovation of your thinking, the updating of your thinking, the updating of your mind. The only way to experience your best spiritually is to eliminate contrary thought patterns and beliefs and to update your mind with current information. That's what people are starving for today. People are starving for current information, current revelation, actually. The world is full of information, but what people need now is really re revelation. Now, the two terms um, of religion, or rather the two extremes, I'm reading that wrong, the two extremes of religion when it comes to the mind and spirituality uh, are challenging. Letter A, we have the mainstream church. These are the two extremes of religion when it comes to the mind and spirituality. We have letter A, the mainstream stream church that has totally divorced the cultivation of the mind from anything 
relative to spirituality. This group is led around like little robots dependent on egocentric preachers to give them their opinions. It is not the preacher's job. Listen to this statement very carefully. It is not the preacher's job to give you your opinion. This is why I don't chime in on a lot of things. I don't tell people who to vote for unless it's just life or death situation. And even then, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I may tell you who I'm voting for or who I think is the, the wiser candidate and why. Um, you know, I, I let people use their own brains because it's not my job to give you your opinion. Some people believe in the vaccine. Some people don't. Well, I, I got the vaccine and ain't no need. You tell me about it. I shouldn't have done. I have the right to make up my own mind. It's just like I give you the right to make up your own mind because all of us need to do what we need to be independent thinkers. If you're going down, go down on something you believed in. Don't go down on something and then say, ooh, ooh, I wouldn't have done this if my pastor hadn't told me. No, 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 no. It's not my job to give you your opinion. My job as your man of God is to empower you to know the truth for yourself and then decipher. You, here's the truth, black and white, and you figure out the gray parts for yourself with your own mind. Jeremiah 3 and 15 says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Which shall feed you with knowledge and what understanding the pastor's job is to feed. The sole purpose of feeding is that something might grow and what strengthen the pastor is not to keep you dependent and weak. The focus is to grow you up and to strengthen you. You know, also, also look at what he feeds you with knowledge and understanding. We could paraphrase this text as such. I will give you teachers to increase your knowledge and your ability to make sound judgments. The spiritual leader is to lead you to a place of independent thinking. Know the word of God for yourself, be in touch with the Holy Spirit for yourself and have the capacity to discern for yourself. That's my job in your life. It's not my job to give you your opinion. It's not my job to run around and police your life, figure out who you sleeping with. If you if you are homosexual, if you not, if you home and if you not, uh, unless you're doing this stuff within the context of the church fellowship, then I have to rebuke you and sit you down and do whatever follow whatever measures I may think necessary to get you in order in terms of the fellowship. It's my job to feed you with knowledge and understanding that you might develop an opinion that is in sync with the creator in line with the word of God and something that you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you into. It's not my job to be around here and creating a codependent church. So letter A, we have the mainstream stream church that has totally divorced the cultivation of the mind from anything relative to spirituality. Letter B, the other extreme is a group that is increasing in number and they preach that everything a man needs is resident within his own mind and being. This is humanism, which basically teaches that man is totally sufficient within himself and that there's no need for the intervention of any divine sovereign being called God because we as men are gods. Of course, you know, that's heresy. But those are the two extremes. You have the church, the um, extremist Christian view. Don't worry about all that thinking. Just, just shout and fall out. You don't need to worry about cultivating your mind. Just shout and fall out. God going to do it. You know what I mean? And then you have the other group that's way over here on the other end. And they're saying, well, we, we, don't, we are gods. We are God. Everything I need is in me. Look what uh, John chapter 15 verses five through eight says. It says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, 
He is cast forth as a branch and is withered and and men gathered him and cast him into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. So he likens the connection between mankind and God as the vine and the branches. A branch can definitely produce certain fruit. As long as it is what connected to the vine. We can never think that we can divorce ourselves from dependence on God because he is the source of all things. Any religion that centers on anything other than Christ is a cult and leads to deceptive destruction. The truth is that man needs knowledge and revelation thought and inspiration. Man needs what? Knowledge and revelation, thought and inspiration. Man is not independent of God. God is not separated from thought. It is not heretical to have a thought or a question. Even God said, come, let us reason together. Now, let's look at this understanding the three part nature of man. If you look in Genesis two and seven, it says in the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, in this text, we see the the, the triunity or the tri nature of man established body mind and spirit. Come on, say that with me. Body, mind and spirit. First, God made a physical body for man to inhabit. This made man capable of, of embracing the natural world. He took dust and dirt and formed man. Mm. It's the Hebrew term uh, neshama, divine Speaking of, well, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Secondly, God breathed into that shell, that physical structure, his own breath. And that term breath is the Hebrew term neshama, divine inspiration, intellect or spirit. God created a shell, a body. God secondly breathed into that shell, his own breath or spirit, intellect. This made man God conscious as a spiritual being. And then thirdly, man became, the Bible says, a living soul. It's the term nefesh, meaning mental desire, mind or a person. This made man self-conscious and capable of discovering the multitude of gifts and abilities God placed within him. His soul or his mind was the container of his greatest potential. So man was physical, made him what? Made him conscious of the natural world. Secondly, God breathed into man spirit. This made man what? God conscious. And then God, the Bible says he became a living soul, which made man self-conscious. Now, the divine balance is that a man must embrace the privilege and responsibility of cultivating his thinking to harmonize with the influences of his born again spirit. You have to you have to embrace and cultivate your thinking that it might harmonize with your born again spirit. Now, the tri nature, let me read this, the tri nature of man functions like a great ship. The body is the ship itself because it carries out the orders given to it. The spirit is the captain on the innermost part of the ship giving the orders. But the mind is the helm that decides if the wishes of the captain are communicated to the ship. The ship goes where the helm turns. 
If the captain does not have a capable wheel, he won't be able to steer the ship in the desired direction. Your body establishes your external image. Your spirit determines your internalized potential, but your mind connects the two to create your reality. So the level of your thinking is the bridge between your inner potential and your outward reality. Proverbs 23 and 7, probably one of the texts that I mentioned more than any. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whatever's going down in the heart of him, in the center of him, whatever the thoughts are. See, these are the thoughts that you're thinking without thinking about. These are the thoughts you're ruminating that are just constantly going over and over again across your mind, in your spirit. It's like a it's like a record, a, a, a looping um, a soundtrack beneath the surface of your life. A person may have a God given potential. And even the ability to realize it. But if he or she has limited thinking, they will be as they think. So God can give you the ability to. To orate like a Dr. Martin Luther King, God can give you the brain of an Apostle Paul. But if in your mind you think that you can't speak or you're dumb, it will never manifest. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. A person may have the potential to go to the mountain's peak. But if you cannot get their thinking out of the valley, they will never get to the top of that mountain. Their mind will always find a way to keep them in that valley. We have to connect thinking and spirituality. There are things that are established in the spirit realm for us that our, our low level thinking is prohibiting us from experiencing. Now, this fact is... Um, vividly demonstrated in the story of the first brothers, Cain and Abel. If you look in Genesis 4, 3 through 8, it says in it, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very angry and uh, his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance, countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt be thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, in this text. We see how the two brothers brought separate offerings to God. Abel's offering was accepted while Cain's was rejected. Cain's rejection created a particular thought pattern of rejection and inferiority. He developed a, a paradigm. Notice in verse seven, God tells Cain, you have the potential to be accepted as well. <laughs> but his mindset would not allow him to manifest his God ordained potential rather than digging deeper to realize his greatest potential. He was subjugated by his dominant mindset. Because a person will always sink, sink to or rise to the level of their dominant thoughts. This means that thinking is a vital component of spirituality and not separate from spirituality. What is resident in the spirit is given birth through the thinking canal. If what's in your spirit is going to manifest in your physical life, your thinking is going to have to 
synergize with your spirit. If you can't think it, you can't have it. So it dies in your spirit as stillborn potential. Now, guess what? That's the introduction to this lesson. And then when we come back, um, we're going to move a little further. All right. God bless you. I hope you got something out of this 